Hallelujah. Who's glad to be in the house of God? Amen. Well, I'm glad you're here today. Um, I want to do a couple of announcements and then, and then we're going to do what we can to close out our series we've been working in. I do want to ask that you would keep several people in prayer as, you know, several members of the praise team and I were standing here just before service and, and we all really just agree on this one thing that it seems like when God is about to do something that only God can do, that one of the telltale signs of that is that the enemy does everything he can to stop that. Amen. And we've been under tremendous attack, the church, the people in the church. Um, so first of all, children, you are dismissed to go with Brother Eric. Is Miss Becky having to work again today, brother? So we need to put Brother Eric at the top of our prayer today. <laughs> Amen. You, sir, are a blessing. Amen. Amen. We, we, uh, I'm asking that we would pray for Brother Brandon and his lovely wife, Rhonda. They were already scheduled to not be here today. It just kind of worked out where they get a little bit of a break, um, as in they're, they're needing God to bring some refreshing and some strength and, and some real good direction for exactly what he would like for them to partake of. Um, and w we really do need to be praying for them. Um, I'm asking that we pray for our, our youth group, our young people in, in this church, in this community. Our young people are, are they're under all-out assault from the enemy. And I just, listen, I remember being that age, and it was a long time ago, but I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't think I would want to be a young person in today's society. Amen. They need our prayers. They need our guidance. They, they need what we can bring into their life. But they also need our understanding. Amen. Amen. And so please, please, please pray for our youth group and our young people. Um, a couple of names. Please keep Brother Lance Martin in your prayers. He just got out of the hospital. He is at home now, right? Yeah. And, and they're looking at about a month worth of him having to, to stay out of work. And, and so anything that we as a church can do to help them, um, we are totally open. We're all ears. Amen. You, you don't know him. Now, Miss Heather, we're still praying for you, believing for an absolute restoration of healing, and that we're going to see victory in this. And can I get an amen on that? Amen. 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 Um, now, you don't, some of you may know him. He was here last week. He's, he's a friend of mine. I'm getting to know him more and more, um, and whether, that, whether they serve here or not, we serve together in the body of Christ, and, and he's just a wonderful man, and he and his family have been under tremendous attack, but we're lifting up Brother James Robertson and his wife, Tonia. She's still in the hospital. It's been a long, long go, and the enemy is doing everything that he can to destroy that family and get them off of the plan of God. They're in the fight still. Amen. And so we're, I told him we are going to continue to pray for him and lift his name and his family up before the throne of God, believing that he will touch them. He will bring them through this season. We've got several families that we're, we're really praying for. I don't want to call too much attention to it. I just want Brother Tim to know, Brother Tim, we are praying for your whole family. Amen. As a matter of fact, can you come down here for just a second? Brother Roy, would you, would you mind coming down here? Um, I just need a couple. Brother Jimmy, I would, can you come here for a minute for just a second? Brother Jeff, can you, can you join me down here for just a minute? We're, we're just going to ask that, that uh, uh, Brother Tim stand in the gap this morning for the entire situation, okay? Um, we don't want to go into too, much, too many details. I'm just going to tell you that the enemy is trying to destroy families and so we're, we're just going to pray. Amen? Amen. And part of this prayer, Brother Tim, as you and I have been talking, it, it, I'm praying that God deals with your heart as much as he does anything else too, okay? Amen. Because th th that's what we're called to be the lead of our homes. And men, we are responsible for what goes on in our homes. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. E- even, if, even if it doesn't necessarily come from us, we are responsible for our homes. And so we have to take responsibility. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come together this morning and we lift Tim to you. We lift Carrie to you. We lift every child in that home to you, Father. We ask right now, Father, that by the power of Jesus Christ, we can see Satan remove his hands off of what he's trying to do here, Lord. I pray for a softening of hearts in both Tim and Carrie, Father. I lift up Carly to you in the name of Jesus, Father. I pray that this family can see a mighty work that can only come from you, Father. So we ask your work in their lives. I pray for protection in the name of Jesus. I pray for provision in the name of Jesus. I pray for peace in the name of Jesus. I pray for restoration in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, that if there's something missing on the foundation in that marriage, that you can put it in place so that that marriage is built on the right foundation, period. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Anybody ever get tired of our families being messed with? Make me want to start a throat punching ministry, man. (laughs) People have signed me up. Yes, ma'am. There's something that Wendy is really needing to help with Lance. Okay. Is his size, he's so tall and, and big. Uh, he needs a wheelchair. Uh, what else was it? A walker? Is that what we think of? A wheelchair and a walker. Yes. Okay. Because he's so big, the regular ones won't. Okay. Okay, we will, we will go to work on that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so now we just need the wheelchair. Amen. Thank you. We'll, amen. We'll, we'll figure it out. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Only as long, one condition, that wheelchair and walker is temporary. Amen. Okay. All right. Now I got to really hurry. Okay, don't miss Wednesday nights. Awesome tacos. Great. Here, you want to pass this around? And what is this? Oh, move this. Yes, ma'am. No, seriously, on on a serious note, um, our Wednesday nights are are phenomenal. They're amazing. We we share a meal every Wednesday night at 630. We break bread together over in the fellowship hall. There's great fellowship, camaraderie. Then at 7 o'clock, we go into our prospective programs, our children's, our nursery, our youth. And then the adults stay behind to let me yell at you for about an hour and 15 minutes. Amen. No, I'm only kidding. We get into the word and we go slow and we let God speak to us. And we've been in the book of Acts for, for a while now. And we're, we're about, oh, I don't know, uh, chapter 17 almost. I think we're, we're going to start chapter 18 this, this next Wednesday. Um, please come and connect. If you can't contribute to the meal, because I understand the times that we're in, please don't let that keep you from coming and connecting. We always have enough food. Amen. Um, Then the the last bit of uh, information uh, announcement wise is please don't forget for those of you that are interested, we're going to have a brief meeting after service today because we are starting a brand new ministry in this church. It's, it's going to be a grief support ministry. Let me clarify to you. We are not starting a grief counseling ministry. It is a grief support ministry because we want to be able to help anybody in any way we can when they're going through stuff. Amen. And so if you're interested in being a part of that specific ministry, uh, just hang out after service uh, for just a couple of minutes so we can get names and get you just a little bit of information as we prepare to move forward. Who's glad you came into the house of God today? Amen. Take your Bibles. I'm going to ask that you would go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. If you're visiting with us this morning, you should know that you are an answered prayer. We hope that you find our church like home for you. Um, if you are visiting and you are a little bit, uh, you know, lost on where we're at in today's series, 
Give me a minute to bring a recap and bring you up to speed. We will finish this series today. I started at the beginning of the month on this series titled, It's Not Too Late Yet. And the reason I titled it that way is, uh, it's, I mean, this topic has been preached many times over, and most of the time it's preached, it's preached in the manner of it's never too late. I just see things a little bit different. I, I, I believe that there will be a time on earth where it will be too late for certain things. Can I get an amen? amen. But we're not there yet. Amen. And so it's not too late yet. And there, there's been a handful of topics that we've talked about. Now, you're in Hebrews chapter 11, but I'm going to remind you about the, our foundation scripture for this, which was Romans chapter 13. And I'm just going to read Romans chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul uh, encouraged us, starting in verse 11. He said, and, and do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of the sleep, for now our salvation is nearer or closer than when we first believed. And so this has been the foundation scripture for this entire series that we, I believe we are getting closer and closer to the return of the Lord. I do not believe this should be used to scare anybody. I surely don't want to preach it that way, but to caution people that God has called us all to be a part of something, something that's bigger than all of us. And you may have a call of God on your life to sing or to preach or to lead a ministry. I'm here to tell you that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you have a mandate from God himself through the Holy Spirit and by the, the co commission of Jesus Christ to be a part of the Great Commission and help to make disciples of all nations. Amen. 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 It is not my job as a pastor to do the body of Christ's job. My job as a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Amen. We're all supposed to be a part of this. And I believe we are getting closer and closer to the return of the Lord. There are great things happening. There are some not so great things happening. But I'm not looking to give you a date. I'm not looking to tell you about signs of times outside of deception. Okay. I'm just here to caution you, to encourage you, to challenge you, to excite you. That it's not too late yet to get involved and do something about what's going on. Can I get an amen? amen? And so that first week in Romans chapter 13, before he even got to this portion of scripture where he says we need to understand the seasons and the time that we're in, before he even said that, he encouraged us to submit to the different types of authorities. The whole idea in that was not just to make obedient and compliant believers. The whole idea in that is we as believers in Jesus Christ are ambassadors from heaven on earth and we are to function to the best of our ability in first and foremost, love. Amen. Amen. We're to love our neighbor in the manner that we would love ourselves. And that's not always the easiest thing to do. So love is always an important avenue we always need to travel on. Whatever you do, it should be done in love. Amen. Amen. That was week one. Then we came back week number two, identifying and addressing a few topics. And week number two, I shared with you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 now, where he encouraged us in verse 13. He said, now abide in these three things, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these was love. Okay, we are to abide not just in love, but in faith and hope. So week number two uh, from scripture, I wanted to encourage you that it's not too late at this point to, I mean, renew our confession unto hope. To, to have a good confession unto hope. Because we live in a world that is hopeless. We're surrounded by people that have no hope. And I, I get it. I see the desperation that's in society. We want to know why can people act the way they're acting. Yeah, that's actually easy to understand. It's because they have no hope. And when somebody has no hope, you become desperate. And when you're desperate, you will make decisions and do things that are not becoming of a rational, logical human being, let alone a Christian or a believer. We want to know why the moral compass is completely off target with mainstream society is because they don't see a moral compass. They have 
no hope. Amen. I mean, I don't want to prove it to you because I don't want to waste the time. But if you need proof, when you go home today, just turn the TV on and watch whatever news program you want to watch. And I promise you, they're going to show you a real negative picture of a hopeless society in just about everything that they say. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle that you voted for. It doesn't matter who your president is. It doesn't matter how you vote. We live in a world that has no hope. Amen. And so that bleeds over into the church. We adapt that into our Christian walk. Instead of us being the influencers of, for God in the world, we're allowing the world to influence the church. And the church is actually getting to a point where the church itself has no hope that we should be operating in. And the Bible tells us that we should have a good confession of hope. Amen. Amen. That means we, we need to get back to where we're talking about what is going right in Christ and not what is going wrong in the world. Amen. Amen. Because we always look at the negative in everything. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. I'm going I'm to prove it to you. Some of you have seen this a hundred times. Bring up Romans chapter 3, verse 23. If... And if, you, if you're not one that memorizes scripture, you, you, you're bound to have at least heard this preached. Okay, this is one of the most popular, well-preached, well-versed, memorized scriptures in, in all of the, the Bible. Romans 3.23. Who can just tell me what it says right now? Yeah, I'm not picking on that. That's true. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But I'm going to prove to you that we always look at things in the negative first. Because the emphasis, of, the emphasis in that specific scripture is not that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's a comma there. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, comma. Which means he's not through speaking. Now let's look at the next verse. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The world does need to know that they need Jesus. All the world has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. But why do we leave it there? By leaving it there, we almost give them no hope. Amen. They need to know, yeah, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But if you're in Christ, you're being justified freely by what Christ has done for you. Amen. That tells me that Troy, the knock-kneed, hack-kneed, hack buck tooth cross-eyed, lying deceiver that, that the law of God says I am, that's not who Jesus says I am. Amen. Amen. The reality in the world that I live in, I'm a fallen man that needed Jesus. The reality of what he's making me is somebody who's being redeemed and set apart. Amen. And I know the other side is true, too, but I choose to focus on what he's doing in me that's good and not where I keep failing. Amen. Amen. We, our confession of hope needs to be revived. Amen. Before we can tell a world about a Jesus that loves us and has died for us, I think we need to believe it ourselves first. Moving on. Then last week, I came and I preached a message to you on part three. It's not too late to... To, to love your neighbor. It's not too late to have a good confession of hope. Uh, I preached on perhaps one of the most, if not the most important outside of today's message, uh, something that we need to restore within the body of Christ today, something that needs to be a part of our lives. So, uh, it's a word. It's become a, a curse word in church, in the ministry. It's a word that people avoid. It's a practice that people do not want because of the stigma that comes with it. Uh, what they've been taught and shown on TV is not what the Bible teaches in this, but we need to come back to a point of repentance. It's not too late to repent. <laughs> I know we made a mess of things. But I woke up today, I still have breath in my lungs, I still have an opportunity to change my mind, change my actions, change my life. It's not too late to repent before God. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. And I showed you three or four circumstances in Scripture where it looked like they had gone too far for God to bring them back. But they repented and God brought them back and God changed things. Why? It's not too late to repent. Amen. Amen. And I, yes, thank you, Father, for giving us an, an environment where we can live in repentance 
as I grow in him, he's teaching me and showing me things that he does not want in my life. He's showing me how he does not want me to act. It is up to me to change the way I function by first changing my mind and living in repentance. Repentance is not an action. Repentance is a lifestyle. Amen. Amen. Then today I asked you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. I hope that you came into this place this morning expecting because I want to talk to you about the hand-in-hand -hand truth that comes with repentance. I don't think it's too late at this point for you and I to change our testimony. Amen. Amen. I want to look at the word testimony. Am I helping anybody today? The word testimony is used 79 times in the New Testament alone in your King James Version Bible. That word testimony is the word martyrio. It's where we get our word martyr from. The word martyr literally means to be a witness or to bear witness or to testify. Now, we're in Hebrews chapter 11 because that's where I'm, I'm going to spend some time today. But you need to understand that in the Bible, in Acts chapter 6, like in verses 1 through uh, the remainder of Acts chapter 6, but specifically verse 3, the apostles at that time in the early church, they, they had a little hurdle on their hands. The church was growing, the daily needs were increasing, and they themselves could not lend their, their full time to tending to the needs of, of very needy people in the situation and working on the prayer and the word and the direction of the church. And so under great wisdom, they had to appoint what we call deacons. These were servants that would come alongside. But there was a requirement. I need you to look at, I'm going to read it to you. Just listen to what verse 3 says. They said, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. That word reputation, it's actually the compound words, good reputation. It said, go find somebody who has a good reputation. It is the exact word that we're looking at here this morning, martyrio having a good witness, having a, a good testimony, bearing a good witness. I think it's high time that we get back and change our testimony. It's not too late yet. Amen. Amen. It's important to have a good testimony. It's important to be a good witness before the world. It's important to bear a good witness about Jesus Christ. Can I just be honest? If, and I mean this sincerely. I'm not trying to be funny. If we were to judge the character of God or define the character of God based upon the actions of the body of Christ, i.e., how the body of Christ has chosen to act, that's how we want to determine the character of God. You follow me, right? If we were to do that, then God is a schizophrenic. God is major bipolar. Come on, because the body of Christ is running unchecked, unaccounted for. We are up and we're down and we're up and are down, we're down. Our testimonies aren't consistent and we're testifying and giving witness about a God who appears to be crazy. But he's not. Amen. And I know something that needs to change and it's not God. We are the ones that need to change. Amen. And we need to learn or maybe relearn how to bear a good witness before the world. That's what this word is all about. And I think we still have time to change our testimony. Um, as we embarked on ministry years ago, we, we were taking surveys and watching the, the, uh, the analytics on the, the landscape of ministry and what we were seeing and what we continue to see today, not that I pay too much attention to the analytics anymore. I'm, I'm more interesting, uh, interested in the relationship uh, with, with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. I'm not real interested in the analytics on how to make something work. But nonetheless, what we've seen is a total shift in, in the landscape of ministry. And what COVID did for the body of Christ was peel the layers back so that we can see what was already taking place in the ministry and the landscape has shifted and let's just be completely honest society whether no matter how wicked society can be society has a voice and their voice right now says they don't trust the church 
Why? Because the church has done a pretty good job at losing the trust of society. Because our witness has not been consistent. I'm not throwing rocks or bricks or stones at anybody today. I'm telling you I'm standing in a mirror and I'm preaching to myself as I'm talking to you. But we get on Facebook, Christian brothers and sisters, with our ideology, our opinions, our, 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 our interpretations of Scripture. And what we do is we argue with one another on social platforms. We fight with one another on social platforms. We, we debate with one another. We, we ridicule one another. We scrutinize one another. We tear one another down in the eyes of the world. And then we turn around and tell the world, you need to trust in the same God we trust in. And they're not. They're not flocking to the church because the church is crazy. Amen. The church is untrustworthy. We've got to stop fighting amongst ourselves. You want to have a good debate? Go eat a meal with your brother or sister and have a good conversation and agree going into it. We are going to be brothers and sisters at the backside of this conversation like we are at the front. Amen. Because I like a good conversation. But I just cannot stomach the idea that I could be responsible for creating division in the body of Christ because they see inconsistency from where I'm at and what I say. Can I get an amen this morning? We have a responsibility to model and bear a good witness before the world. Amen. Amen. This is really good preaching, Pastor. You're in Hebrews chapter 11, and so I want to start there. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible, because it's what we call the Hall of Faith. Hebrews chapter 11, 40 verses worth of just example after example of men and women all chalked up through the old covenant that had to fight a good fight and stand for what was right and learn their lessons and learn to trust and love a God. And what is so amazing about chapter 11 is every one of these names mentioned in it were very, 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 times a million, very imperfect people. There were liars and cheaters and deceivers. There was adulterers. There were murderers. All of these people mentioned in this, by the standards that we should live by, they all failed and failed miserably. But there's something about the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. I've never heard it called this way. This is just how I see it in my mind. Verse 2 and verse 39 are what I term, deem to call the bookend truths of Hebrews chapter 11. Because they, the, the, those two verses say the very same thing, and it's an axiomatic truth that we need to grab a hold of. I am not about to preach to you a greasy grace, an idea that God wants to just leave you in a sinful state. I'm not about to convey an idea to you that sin doesn't matter before God. I'm trying to convey an idea to you that there is no sin that man can invent in their wicked heart that God's grace can't go overcome to bring them back. Amen. Amen. And Hebrews chapter 11 is part of my case study proof that this is the fact. Because verse 2 and verse 39 say, It's by faith that these people, these elders, obtained a good testimony. Said it in verse 2. Said it in verse 39. But we look through this entire chapter and we see Abraham who lied on a number of occasions to preserve himself. We, we, we see his son Isaac followed in the footsteps of daddy and lied to prefer, preserve himself. We see his son literally deceive his own brother to get the blessing. We, we see as the line goes forward, there, there's David who not just lied. Through his lying, he committed adultery. And through his adultery, he tried to cover it up by having the man, the, the husband of the one he committed adultery with killed in battle. So he was a murderer, he was an adulterer, he was a deceiver, he was a liar. Are you guys hearing me this morning? We're talking about Rahab the harlot. For the sake of keeping it G-rated, we're not going to talk about what happened in her life. But yet, they obtained a good testimony by faith. That means there's hope for Troy. Come on. That means there's hope for you because we have something they did not. Bring up verse 39, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. Am I helping anybody? I forgot to tell you, this is all my opening. (laughs) 
Look at this. This says the exact same thing as verse 2, but it adds a little something to it. And all of these, well, all of these are the ones I just mentioned. Uh, there's Cain, and, and Abel is, is, is mentioned in the very beginning. There's Enoch, and, and, and we, we see Japheth, and Barak, and, and Samson, and then the list just goes on and on and on. It says, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. What they mean by that is they were on that side of this covenant that you and I have now. And Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6 says that you and I, because of what Christ did on the cross, you and I have a better covenant that's based upon better promises than what they had. They stood their ground and by faith in what God said, they found a good testimony and they didn't receive what you and I were born into. Are you guys hearing me this morning? So that tells me that if, if they could obtain a good testimony with their covenant, we can absolutely obtain a great testimony in our covenant. Amen. Amen. I love reading the Bible. A good testimony comes only by faith. Now, faith, faith. 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 Faith is the key. Faith is perhaps the most important subject that we should weigh out in our walk. We achieve nothing without faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. We sell verse two. It's by faith they obtained a good testimony. Look at verse three. Go to Hebrews chapter eleven, verse three. Aaron, I want you to see what faith has done for us. What faith gives us. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. By faith, this is where our, our brothers and sisters on the way far right of where we might be, maybe be the way far left, it doesn't matter, but way far away from where we're at today, they take this to an extreme, and this is where we get the name it and claim it idea. That if you just want whatever it is that you want in your heart, you want the big bank account, and you want the nice car, and you want the big house, you've got to speak that into existence. That's not what this is talking about. This, but this is the measure of truth that's in that. This is saying... It's by faith that we understand that everything that you see, God spoke into existence. Think about the words he used here. By faith, we understand that God framed the world that we live in. That tells me that if there's a miracle needed in my life, that all logic, all ration, all medicine, all science, any, all professionalism says it's impossible, what they're not understanding is everything that we see now was spoken into existence and framed by the word of God. And faith causes us to believe that. So if God wants us to have that breakthrough, if it's part of his will, he can rewrite anything he needs to rewrite. He can, he can cause anything to happen according to his will. Can I get an amen? make something that didn't exist as if it did exist. Why? Because he's the inventor of all things that we see. Yeah. By faith, we understand that by faith. You can't go make logic out of that. That's why when Abraham, or let me be a little more clear, that's when Abram at that time stood before God, childless. Wife was at a point where she could not bear and bring a child according to customs and logic and science and medicine. Biologically, it made no sense. His name being Abram stood there and the name Abram was a direct conflict, a contrast of who he was because Abram means father. And so he's standing before the world literally with all of his inheritance right there and all he had was servants because he had no children. And so when he'd introduce people, this is Eleazar, my servant. Well, what is your name again? Well, it's Abram. Well, that means father. I don't see any kids. And so he goes before God, petitions God, and God speaking to him about being a father of a multitude of nations. God tells him in Genesis 15, you, 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 he said, look up into the sky. Can you count the stars? Look at the sand. Can you count the sand grains? 
because your descendants are going to outnumber all of those. And when it made no sense, he believed God's word. And God made something that didn't exist to cause it to exist because there was a man that would believe God's word. Amen. That's what this means. Oh, and by the way, it's one of my favorite stories in the scripture, just like all my stories. Can you just imagine that conversation with God that day? Well, God, we got this little problem here. I mean, I, I believe what you're saying, but I got this contrast, this conflict. Man, my, my name means Father. So when I, when I introduce myself, I'm saying, Father, I, I, I need this change. God, I need you to help me out here. So, so God, I'm paraphrasing. God says, okay, let me change your name. You're, you're no longer going to be called Abram. You're going to be called Abraham. Huh. Okay, thank you, Abraham. That means a father of a multitude now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Why? God said it. God's going to do it. Yes. Amen. 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 We're talking about faith now. Faith. Faith. I'm going to submit to you today in just the next couple of minutes that we must use faith to have a good testimony because there's something that happens in the process that I believe God is looking for. Are y'all ready? Faith. Faith is so important. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen. Listen to this. Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, he said, have faith in God. Jude said in Jude chapter 1, verse 20, build yourself up on your most holy faith. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, you're going way too fast, pastor, sorry. Fight the good fight of faith. Listen to me. John said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes. Finish it. Can, can, I, can I mess with your theology for just a second? Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes. And most of our translations say ours or yours or even ours. Faith. Can I tell you what's not in the authorized version? The words yours, ours, or even. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith. Come on. Come on. Faith is the key to everything. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. There is something, as I was researching this, oh, by the way, today wasn't supposed to be titled um, or having a better testimony. As a matter of fact, I had an entire sermon prepared on we have opportunity to become a better disciple under Christ, which is a really, really good message. I feel that I'm supposed to preach this this morning. So I was lit literally rewriting this this morning for this purpose because I saw something in Scripture where I know the Holy Spirit said, mm, right there, right there, focus. And I'm going to submit to you humbly. This may not even be for you. This may be for me. But I'm going to share with you what God is doing in me because maybe it's going to change somebody else's life too. Can I get an amen? Listen to this. There is something special that can happen when real faith leads one to a better testimony. It's by faith that all these that failed acquired or obtained a good testimony. Faith is the substance of things that is hoped for. It's the evidence of things that's not yet seen. How do you know God is real? Because there's people that still are crazy enough to believe that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. Amen. Amen. That's the evidence of what hasn't been seen yet, is that we know in our heart that God is going to do this. Amen. Amen. All right. I was looking here at a guy named Enoch. In Genesis chapter 5, verses 18 through 23, I just want to read to you the historical account of what we know about Enoch. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Verse 21, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. Can I just, can, you have to hear this part. He walked 
with God. If we're taking a test tomorrow, I'm trying to give you the answer to the test. Enoch walked with God. He didn't carve his own path and call it God. He walked with God. It doesn't take a brain surgeon to understand the reality here. Faith in what he's doing, but the key is walking with God. Amen. Amen. Listen to this. He walked with God 300 years, had sons and daughters. Verse 23. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Wow. Okay. So for those of you that may not understand, Enoch is one of two people in the entire scripture that we don't see actually having a death. Okay. That many believe in eschatology in some way, shape, or form, there's a chance he could be some kind of a player down the road. Okay, great conversation, but I'm not going to build a theology or a doctrine on it. I'm going to tell you the fact is, the Bible says, historically speaking, that Enoch walked with God and was no more. Amen. But yet, as you read through the Bible, you start to see Enoch's name pop up here and there. And then I was studying... And I was in the book of Jude because the book of Jude is one of the most amazing, mind-blowing uh, books in the entire Bible because of the revelation that comes out in the, the book of Jude. And I had this thought that jumped off the page. Actually, I had like 10 thoughts, but I'm only going to talk to you about one tonight, uh, today. Okay, here's Jude. Jude was the brother of Jesus. Okay, history teaches us that of the four brothers that Jesus had here on earth, biologically speaking, that they didn't necessarily believe in him or follow him until after the resurrection when they realized you are who you say you are, and here's the proof. And we get writings from at least two, the book of James is the brother of Jesus, and the book of Jude. Okay, has anybody ever asked the question, how is it Jude had such great insight? Because he appears to be a marvelous Jewish historian in the Jewish culture. Because in his debates, in his letter, he's literally writing about the apostate mindset. And he doesn't talk about just the apostates in the future. He talks about those that were apostate in the past. And he makes these correlations through the book of Jude, okay? And you get to verse 14. Listen to this. Am I helping anybody today? Jude chapter 1, verse 14. In his historical debate on the, the importance to not be apostate or not turn away from God. I.e., he's saying you need to continue walking with God. He says, now, Enoch, he's about to reach back and grab another example. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, the, those that are in apostate, okay, prophesied about these men also saying this and everything i'm going to read to you over the next minute or two are nothing but quotes that jude gives to enoch okay and he quotes this is enoch speaking behold the lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them uh, uh, of, of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Well, we use that in our eschatology, our end times understanding. We, we look that there's still going to be a time when this is going to be fulfilled, that the Lord is going to return with thousands and thousands and ten thousands of those that put their faith in him. Can I get an amen? We get that from Enoch, not Jude. Jude was just the historian that connected us to Enoch. When did Enoch say that? I just read to you the entire historical account that the Bible gives us of Enoch. It was just a couple verses that said he begot him and he begot him and he begot him. Oh, and he walked with God and was no more. <laughs> There's not any... I flipped... The... There's got to be more! What... Well, there's not in the Bible because it's in the Jewish customs that they understood that there's a book named Enoch that was part of the historical account that we do have access to today where he brings insight. But the reason that we take it with validity is because Jude mentions this book and how Enoch spoke. Well, this is really important because obviously Enoch was a very important 
player in this because he spoke a prophecy about what we're going to get to experience. Enoch was part of the system that said we win in the end. <laughs> Come on, church. This is exciting. So we get to the book of Hebrews. We're talking about the heroes in faith. And then we get to verses 4 and 5 and 6. Listen to this. I'm talking to you today about your testimony and how faith in God brings a good testimony to you. But it also does something that's even better than you having a good testimony. You see, your good testimony is really about you. This, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to show you something, what God showed me. And God wants you to have a good testimony. But can I tell you what God wants more than you having a good testimony? God wants to be pleased through you. Long before he wants you to have a good testimony. That's the problem with the church today. We keep making everything about us. How I look, how I'm received, how I'm perceived. Me, 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 me. Well, I do want us to have a good testimony so the society will trust the church again. But before I want you to have a good testimony so you look more pretty every day, I want you to have a good testimony so that you can stand before God and Him and say to you, Well done! Because that's what I'm going to prove to you right now. That having a good testimony in faith should be about you pleasing him. Or am I helping anybody today? This isn't popular in today's culture because it takes it out of our hands. It's not about you. It's about him. Amen. Listen to this. This is Hebrews chapter, five, uh, chapter 11, verse 5. He just told us in verse 4, by faith Cain did, or Abel did this, and it was Cain. Then he gets to Enoch. Enoch. I mean, we don't know much about it. He walked with God and was no more. Enoch, who Jude quotes and says, man, he saw something that's going to happen to you and I that includes you and I thousands of years ago. Enoch, here we go. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and he was not found. This is the author of Hebrews of which I, I'm going to prove to you here in a minute because um, I've heard a lot of debate. Well, Hebrews was written by Paul. They just didn't put his name down. Or he was written by one of the other apostles. They just didn't put their name down. Or, or Hebrews was written by Barnabas. They just didn't put his name down. I'm going to submit to you here in a minute who I think wrote the book of Hebrews, but listen to what the author said. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God has taken him. Now listen to this. For before he was taken, he, being Enoch, had this testimony, same word, this bearing witness, this testimony, this reputation, that he pleased God. Oh, wow. That's a testimony right there. Well, Enoch got some real good insight. He pleased God. That's the better story. Troy invented all kinds of great stuff and saved many people. Or Troy believed God and he pleased God. Come on, church. We get a chance to rewrite our epitaph on our headstone by having a testimony that said everything they went through, they pleased God. We need to fall in love with this idea one more time. Everything we do, should do we should do it to honor God, to please God. I could prove it to you. Are y'all ready? Okay. Quickly, just because we're going to look in the book of Hebrews in chapter 13, and I'm almost done, I promise you. But before we get there, Aaron, go to Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to show you, just, just for you, this is just side, side fun. Studying the scripture is a blast. Amen. Amen. And if you've got questions about scripture, don't go ask somebody else before you first go to the word and look for it, because the scripture interprets scripture. Amen. Amen. Well, I've, I've been in the debates. I've seen them. I've seen people get nose to nose about who wrote the book of Hebrews. I've even heard somebody say it was a woman that wrote it. And the reason that they didn't give the name is because women were not, not allowed to be mentioned in that time. I'm not going to say it's not a woman, but I'm going to tell you who it's not. It wasn't Paul. He heavily influenced this. It wasn't Barnabas. It wasn't James, Peter, John. It, it wasn't any of those. I, I'm convinced it was a secondary disciple of one of those. You, it, all you got to do is read. Are y'all ready? Look at verse, let's start in verse one. This is Hebrews chapter two, verse one. 
Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. Keep going. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, go. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? Okay? This is the author of Hebrews saying when Jesus came as a man, he literally started connecting everything we heard in the old covenant about what, for, connected to what he was about to do for this new covenant. Jesus himself spoke this, okay? Comma, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Just, just think it out for just a second. He's literally, whoever this is, is admitting, I was trained by one of the disciples or the apostles that heard Jesus say this. Amen. The Bible, studying the Bible is a blast. That, that has nothing to do with what, what we're talking about today. I just wanted to give that to you so that you can have it too. Let's go to chapter 13. Am I helping anybody today? I know you guys were like, I thought you were going to give me a name. Just tell you who it wasn't. All right. Hebrews chapter 13. And I promise you, as we work through this, I'm going to reference one more scripture, but I'm, I'm going to relax my argument that through faith, there's something that happens when our testimony lines up with what God is trying to do. And through obedience and all these things, we become pleasing to God. And that's what's more important. Amen. Than us polishing up our history, fixing damage control on the reputation, right? I mean, we've all had to do it. I, I, I thank God for the delete button on the computer. I mean, here lately, I have things typed out that I'm about to just let go and, mm, and the Holy Spirit's like, no, let's, let's do that delete. Amen. Amen. Because if you send that, then we've got months of damage control that we've got to do, right? Because we've all done it. Okay. I'm not going to read verse for verse. We're going to get down to verse 9, okay? So, uh, Aaron, go down to verse 9. I'm going to paraphrase to you what the first eight verses are saying. Okay. The author of Hebrews, as he's writing, I can tell you exactly what the book of Hebrews is about. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish believers who believed in Jesus Christ, but they were under pressure to keep the things of the law also, okay? And so to bring clarity in the middle of all that, they were also being told that maybe you need to be looking for somebody other than Christ, okay, this guy Jesus. So the author of the book of Hebrews is literally writing to the Jewish believers first, telling them, you guys, you put your faith in Jesus, you're good. There's, we are not looking for anybody else to show up. Jesus was that guy. And systematically, starting in chapter 1 all the way through the book of Hebrews, he systematically lines up all the Old Testament heroes Okay, even angels, and, and he talks about David, and, and all these wonderful, wonderful examples, and says they were great, they were awesome, but they're not Jesus. And compared to Jesus, they don't match up, because Jesus is that awesome. As a matter of fact, the covenant, and, 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 and the temple, and the sacrifices, no, that doesn't match up for what Jesus, he's literally saying Jesus is the guy, there's nobody better, he's greater than all of them, okay? Then he gets to chapter 13, and just like we see Peter do um, and Paul, they know that this is going to be the last writing that they're going to submit to the world. And so it's like they're going to cover some of the most important things, the last word out the door before mom and dad go to town. Okay, now I know I've told you three times, but make sure you lock the door or, you know, don't strangle the cat or whatever it is that, that pe people do. The most important things that mom and dad don't want us to do or to do, they always say three or four times out the door, right? Come on now. The Bible is the same way, especially this letter right here, because right off the bat from verses one through eight, he, he, he says this. He reminds the, 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 the followers of this. He says, OK, make sure you continue to love a brotherly love. OK, be patient with one another. He says to show benevolence. Don't stop showing benevolence. He, this is where we get the phrase where he says you may be t tending to somebody that might be an angel and you don't even know it. So never stop showing benevolence to strangers. Okay, again, this isn't just a Paul thing. This is, this is a Peter thing. And now this is an author of Hebrews thing. 
I'm sorry, this just keeps coming up because I think the body of Christ needs to hear this constantly in today's society. He literally says, honor the marriage and don't be a fornicator or an adulterer. He says, those are the ones going to find judgment from God. Oh, well, that's kind of harsh, but it's true. We've got to get the sexual immorality out of the body of Christ. All right. He said, don't live with envy. Don't live constantly being envious of what somebody else has. And then he says, and I, I don't mean this to be funny, because this is a chapter where, as a pastor, I could probably really try to manipulate people in a pretty good way. Because there's, there's a part in there where he says, uh, honor and remember those that speak the word of God to you and watch over you. Because it's a reality. Amen? It, it's important. I'm not even going to ha highlight that. That's just in it. Then we get to verse 9, and we're going to read it up here as we work through this, because I, I just want you to see this. Are y'all with me this morning? Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines. Yeah, that, that keeps coming up too. We live in a day of deception. And we see over and over and over the caution to don't get carried away with ideas. The worst thing for the body of Christ today is be driven by emotions and feelings. We have ministries that will start up and stop over feelings. It can't be about your feelings. Feelings are fun. It's great. But we don't build doctrine on feelings. Because sure enough, I'll wake up and not feel the same way today. Does that mean my doctrine changes? They do it, though. They will divide doctrine, separate fellowship, and break fellowship because they're just not feeling it today. Feelings. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you can see my passion behind this. We need to get Hollywood out of church. You complete me. No, you don't. No, you don't. Sorry. Brother, you're going to have to edit that, okay? Listen to this. For it is good that the heart be established by grace. The, the, your, your righteousness should not be on the fact alone that you're afraid of hell. You should be afraid of hell. But your righteousness should not be led or driven by not wanting to go to hell. Your righteousness should be based in the fact that it was built in his grace. That's what it let your heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. In his whole argument, he's contrasting grace opposed to practicing in the law. In the law, it was important what you could eat and could not eat, okay? They divided themselves over what you were allowed to eat and not eat. And he's literally saying it's good to be established by grace and not the law. Okay, go to the next verse. We have an altar from which those that practice the law, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. Uh, that, that, that punched me in the face. The, the, I, we're, we try to be nice about you can't push the law on people for salvation. He's being mean about it. He's being blunt. He said, for those that practice that, they don't even have a spot at our table. <laughs> oh, okay, wow, here we go. Are y'all listening to him? Let's go. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Okay, go to the next verse, but I'm going to explain that previous verse. He keeps applying the practice of how they were dealt with in the tabernacle. They would bring the sacrifice. They'd present it to the priest. They would kill the sacrifice, present the offering to God. They would take the remains outside of the tent, outside of the camp, and burn the remains. And they did this constantly. In, in, in earlier in chapters 9 and 10, it really talks about this daily practice that they had to do for the atonement of sins was a, a, a redundant and bloody mess constantly having to get an animal to cover for their sins. And here comes Jesus, and he dies once for all. Amen. And so he just, he's, I'm not slandering the law. I'm trying to tell you. He's saying if you try to find your righteousness by being a good boy or a good girl within the law, you don't even have a spot at his table right now. 
because they practice this, but look at this. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Now go, go, go. Listen to this. Therefore, let us go forth to him. Oh, He's literally saying, if, if you're in church for religious reasons, and, and that's all you're in church for, if you're in the temple for religious reasons, you need to go find where they went for Jesus. Because they dealt with Jesus outside. This is where we go find him. Outside of the camp, bearing his reproach. Go, go, go. Listen to this. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Oh, this new covenant that he's brought us. Now let's go. i got to show you this. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Look, uh, a few weeks ago, there was what people call a revival start in a college campus. And it didn't take long for it to move to different campuses. And it's now come under scrutiny from many in the body of Christ who don't like what they're seeing. And I'm not going to throw rocks at anybody. I, I'm not calling it a revival. I'm calling it a movement. Because it, it, all it took was for a group of people to say, we're going to worship God. It's not like they got on the phones and called everybody at Lee University and said, hey, can you call your buddies at Chattanooga, Tennessee, and, and we're going to do this? No. They just began to praise God and worship God, and the Holy Spirit began to move. And it, though they decided to change how they're doing it there, the movement is still sweeping the nation. And I believe it's going to go through college campuses, and it's going to land in the churches where people are gathering together for the sole purpose of putting out their testimony and their service by praising Him. Amen. You want sacrifice to God? What God wants from you and I is to do what we did this morning in this building, and we're going to celebrate Him, and we're going to worship Him, and we're going to praise Him. Even if you came out of a, a lifestyle of sin last night, and you got the smell of sin on you, the best place for you, the only place for you, is to be in an environment of praise and worship so that God and the Holy Spirit can work on us. Amen. That's what, he doesn't want us practicing religion. He wants us to go find where they went. And where they went is where Jesus was at. And they're, they're, this is their sacrifice, praise. Therefore, let us continually offer sacrifices of praise. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Go, go, go. Listen to this. But do not forget to do good. There you go. It proves to you I'm not preaching a, a sloppy grace to you, an abuse of grace. How dare we say we're going to praise God and then deliberately go out and not do what God wants us to do. Let us not forget to do good and to share. That word share is where we get our word benevolence from, okay? It's also the word koinonia, where we get fellowship. And the word koinonia means to be a participant in. And so, yeah, we give praises to him, but we cannot forget to do good and to have fellowship and be a participant for with such sacrifices, what sacrifices? The praise from our lips, doing good, having fellowship, being a partaker in this. With these sacrifices, God is well pleased. We build our testimony by pleasing God. We please God because this is what we choose to offer as sacrifices now. If you're sitting here today and you're like, wow, you're really making it sound like God's not worried about your conduct. Can I just tell you something? God is concerned about our conduct. Let's go to Romans chapter 12, and this is the last verse that we're going to go to. Have I helped anybody today? It's about being pleasing to God. I want my testimony to be a good testimony before you, but long before you think good of me, I want God to think good of me. I don't want to do stuff because I need a perception in the community that Pastor Troy's a good dude. I've tried that. And by being a good dude, there are people that just don't like me and they go out in the community anyhow and turn my name into mud. Come on. And they do it to you too. And so I just, I'm not here to please you. I'm going to stand before him and say, that's what I want you to do, son. Amen. It's not the easiest thing. Sometimes it's really hard. 
and I'm, I fail and I miss all the time. I'm always dragging myself to the throne. Of, it says to go, come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace. Can I just be honest with you? Most of the time I limp to the throne of grace. <laughs> Sometimes I approach the throne of grace as if God doesn't see me coming, you know. <laughs> oh, looky there. No. <laughs> Why? Because we mess up, right? I just want him to be pleased with me. But, but here's proof that, that you and I, uh, sacrifices that we make, we praise him. We do good and we're part of the fellowship. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and then I'm done. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Aaron. Is it frozen? It is? No? no? Okay. Listen to this. You can't get away from this. There, there's, no, there's no moving around this. God expects that we would do everything we can do to, to live as holy as we can, knowing the obedience in this is not what makes us righteous, but what we ought to do is do what he's made us. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, you present your body a living sacrifice. Come on. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, listen. I remember being in a pastor's conference one day and the pastor, the leader of the whole thing was leading us through this because there was all kinds of things being taught about this. And, and, and Jim Hester was his name. He made it sound so simple that we left that room thinking, wow, we're just beginning to learn because we've been complicating this. And he said, it's as simple as this. He said, Paul speaking to the church and said, I, I beseech you, which means I beg you, man, you need to hear this. Brethren, by the mercies of God. We're all in the mercy of God. He said that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, he was talking to men in the room, and he was saying, men, you live in a world that is full of temptation. Stop making excuses for this, because God's given you an ability to overcome temptation. We're all thinking theologically, right? Man, doctrinally speaking, yeah, you bet it. And I started thinking of scriptures. And then he said, nope. Man, he gave you a neck that gives you the ability to turn your head and not look at what you're being tempted with. Come on now. He said, when you see temptation, you present yourself a living sacrifice by turning your head and not looking at it. Come on now. Are y'all hearing me today? He said, this is a reasonable service. Because you, men, women, people, you are literally saying in the moment, God is more important to me. Come on. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So later that day, we, we went to lunch, and me and another pastor, one of the main pastors in the church, we got dropped off to go into the restaurant and secure the, the sitting area for our lunch, and we had like 30 pastors coming in. And so we're standing there, and in, in walks this young lady, and I don't even know why she called it clothes, because it shouldn't have been called clothes that she was wearing. That she left nothing left to the imagination. Everybody saw her when she walked in. We just came out of a session. And I looked at Brother Eric, and Brother Eric looked at me, and we both turned our head, and Eric, as loud as he could, he says, Do you smell that, God? Do you smell that? Is that pleasing to you? I knew exactly what he was doing. That's an aroma that was pleasing to God in that moment. Why? Because we weren't going to succumb to the temptation. This is what he means when, when to do good. Do good. It's a reasonable service. Present your body that living sacrifice before him. Amen? I think it's not too late to change our testimony. And we change our testimony by faith in what he's done. And in the process, just be obedient to these three things. We're going to please him. Can I pray for you this afternoon? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this day, for your truth, for every person that's in this room. I thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit is still at work. And in every one of these areas, you've proven that it's not too late for us to change our testimony, for us to repent for us to change our confession of hope and for us to literally learn to, to love our neighbor in the manner that you would 
uh, have us to, Father. And I thank you, Father, that you are still at work in us. As we prepare to leave here, I pray that you would go with us, that you would go before us and prepare a path and bring us into a divine connection with somebody today, tomorrow, this week. Somebody that we could literally show and demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ to. Somebody that we can make an impact with. I pray that you bring us back Wednesday night, Father, with a spirit of expectation. We continue to lift up those that we're praying for. And we believe that through everything, Lord, that you will be glorified. It's in Jesus' name that I pray and the church said amen. I love each and every one of you. God bless you.